Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the fourth episode of the Voices of Sustainability Virtual Fireside Chat series. My name is Jessica Chiam, Founder and Managing Director of EcoBusiness, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. For those who are unfamiliar, the Zayat Sustainability Prize is the United Arab Emirates pioneering global award for recognizing sustainability and humanitarian solutions around the world. Since its establishment, sorry, since its establishment more than a decade ago, the prize has awarded 86 winners who have collectively impacted the lives of over 352 million people around the world across the categories of health, food, energy, water, and global high schools. The topic of our conversation today is Indigenous communities and climate change. I'm delighted to be joined by two very distinguished guests who will share their perspectives on this fascinating topic and provide insights on how climate change is impacting Indigenous peoples and the important role they play in building climate resilience. I'd like to invite all of you to engage in our discussion by sharing your thoughts in the chat boxes available to you and to join us in our conversation. I'd now like to introduce our speakers. Our first guest is Her Excellency Razan Khalifa Al Mubarak, who is the Managing Director of the Mohammed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund. Among other roles, she served as the Secretary General of the Environment Agency Abu Dhabi and is the Managing Director of Emirates Nature WWF. She was also named by the World Economic Forum as one of the top 100 young global leaders in 2018. Our second guest is Ms. Hindu Umaru Ibrahim. She is an environmental activist and member of Chad's pastoralist Bororo people and a strong defender of the rights of indigenous communities. She also serves as a UN Sustainable Development Goal Advocate, Conservation International Board member, and most recently has joined the Zayed Sustainability Prize Jury. Thank you both for joining us here today. My pleasure. I now like to start by perhaps fielding the first question to Her Excellency. Your work has been closely associated with the great success of the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Arabian Oryx reintroduction program. This program has brought the Arabian Oryx back from extinction. Can you share with us how did the indigenous tribal knowledge play a role in the success of this initiative? Um, thank you very much, Jessica. And at the onset, I'd like to take also this opportunity to thank our viewers, thank our listeners. Um, our agendas are, 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 are fully packed with Zoom calls and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and, and others. And, and to, to dedicate the time to listen to this topic is, is, is important. So I really would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone. And of course, to thank uh, Hindu for part participating. I'm a great fan and I've been following your work. So it's a great privilege to be on the same panel as you. So going back to your question, Jessica, um, first and foremost, um, the success of the Arabian Oryx project really goes down to its people, the people of Abu Dhabi. Um, and uh, I wish I could take credit for this project, but I really can't. This is the project that started with the establishment of my country 50 years ago. And I think it's a testament that the cultural identity of the Emirates of the UAE is very closely associated to that of nature. And that really goes to the heart of the issue that I'd like to talk about or the message that I'd like to say here is when you talk about a people, a collective people who have endured many hardships to survive within, within a harsh environment, this collective knowledge, this collective wisdom is really the root of what makes projects successful. Um, it is in, through my experience that I very much believe that conservation programs are only successful if we have the people, the, uh, the, the roots of the grasses really engaged. Um, and with this project, we've had the privilege to have not just the people engaged, but the people across many generations. Um, Abu Dhabi, you know, it's the father of the gazelle. You know, it starts, like I said, with the roots. It's carried by the people. Of course, there's a vision um, that, that is there and that has been initiated by the founder of the country. But what's beautiful is that it was taken from the founder to the current conference, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. But then this vision was institutionalized. 
and you had many organizations working for the protection of, of this iconic species. And I'll stop there, Jessica. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for sharing that. Perhaps I can turn to Ms. Abraham. You're a member of the Bororo Pastoralist People and a voice for indigenous communities across the globe. And this group of people have a very close relationship with the environment and are also among the first to face the brunt of the effects of climate change. So in your view, what are some of the biggest challenges that indigenous communities face today due to the climate crisis? Thank you very much, Jessica. It's really a great pleasure to be with all of you. And thank you, Razan. I'm so excited to be in this panel with you and hearing about our same excitement on how we can protect nature. And I really like the sentence that you say, we cannot protect nature without putting peoples in the heart of it. So this is all about the indigenous peoples and this is all about what I'm fighting also. So, you know, as coming from the indigenous communities in the Sahel regions, so Chad is one of the example of climate change impact. Because when we talk about the Paris agreements, we always say that uh, our goals is 1.5 degree. Of course, we will stick on it until we get only not more than 1.5 degree. But in Chad, the first example is we already reached 1.5 degree. When you take all the data from 99 to now, the temperature is increased by 1.5 degree. So this is the concrete examples. And when you have all these, so you have the extreme weather events who become the new realities of these regions. So from the flood to the drought, because the temperature is raising and all this got an impact on the natural resources. So uh, I give you the example of the Lake Chad that uh, used to be the famous examples that everyone knows. So since 1996, uh, when my mom get born, so, it was 25,000 kilometers square of the fresh water. And 40 years later, when I just get born, it was shrink to 90% of this water. So 90% of the water evaporated. Only about 2,000 or sometime when there is flood, 3,000 kilometers square of the water that remain around this lake. is the big fresh water around this region where you have more than 40 million people living and depending from this ecosystem because they are farmers, they are pastoralists, or they are fisher peoples. And they are coming surrounding all the countries who are around the, the lake. So that's mean the climate change impact. It is our daily reality of me. And as an indigenous communities, you know, we always depending from the rainfall, we live from one place to another one to found water and pastures. So that's mean our life become more and more difficult because if there is not enough water, you cannot get enough crops or enough pastures for your cattle, and then you have to move to another place. And when you move to another place, it is the conflict between the communities where you get in. So this impact the social life of the communities. And when you see the conflict growing up around all the regions. So with the impact of the environment and then impact on the food security, conflict, so those are the new realities my regions and my country and my communities are experiencing because of the climate change. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, climate change is something that's affecting communities all over the world. Before, I think Indigenous peoples, it's so closely connected with them because it's so much part of their lives. Have you seen, you know, some of the responses that, you know, they have uh, come up to address climate change in their communities? Uh, of course. So, uh, for all this uh, impact, you know, communities is still living without like accessing the clean water to drink. And of course, there is no electricity at all that can help them maybe to transform things. But the unique solutions that we have are based, based on our traditional knowledge. And the traditional knowledge of the indigenous communities around the world is the big richness that where we observe the nature, we learn a lot. For us, Nature is our supermarket because we collect food we need. It is our hospitals because we have our medicine to cure ourselves. 
it is our school and university because we are learning every single day by observing an insect and trees and bears, even our own cattle. And you know, I give you the examples because in the modern world, there are a lot of technology that replacing the knowledge who used to be there to help people to the facility. But those modern technology need a substance that call it energy or access to the electricity. But if you don't have access to those devices, you don't have access to the electricity, you have to be innovator yourself. So for us, the best app and the best technology we have, it is the nature. So when we wanted to observe the weather forecast, so we need just to look at the insect, the little tiny insect that is moving on the ground, or we need just to observe the bear's migration those who are not talking, but who fly. We need just to observe the size of the fruits in each season. We need to observe just the wind direction or the cloud positions. All those help us to determine the weather forecast and help the community to build the resilience and get adapt even with the climate impact. Thank you so much. I think that's uh, really some good points there. Uh, we really need a thriving planet for our communities to thrive. And perhaps I can turn back to Her Excellency. You know, in uh, I followed your work for a long time, and you've always often said that you know we need a thriving planet to ensure that women, youth, and societies can do well. So, can you perhaps share? You know, what is that internet intricate connection for you, and especially in relation to women's role in society? Um, thank you, Jessica. You know, ab absolutely. So history has shown um, over thousands of years, communities have thrived when there had, and exactly what Hin Hindu had alluded to, when we have access uh, to nature. You look at, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient China, um, Africa, uh, Mesoamerica. So across cultures, across, um, across thousands of miles, you know, the, the recipe has been quite interesting. You know, you have a fertile crescent and you have cultures and you have a thriving community. Um, Sheikh Zayed actually once said, and that's why, you know, you know let, me, let us green the desert so that we are able to um, build our community. And, but unfortunately, you know, over the years, we've become increasingly disconnected from this natural world. 55% uh, of the world's population live in cities. And as we become further removed from the supply chain, uh, we perhaps don't appreciate the collective burden of 7.8 billion people have on the planet. I mean, over the last 200 years, only 200 years, we have altered half of the planet's ecosystems. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, we are losing species at a rate that we have not seen in the past, in, in, in 10,000 years. Um, we're losing 10,000 species every year. The uh, UN report also stated that over the next year, we're at mil a, million of, a million species could be at risk of extinction. So I think we need to have an awakening to recognize that it's not us versus nature. It's not, not us versus it. We are very much part of nature and we are intertwined with the fate of, of nature. Um, so this uh, recognition, this awakening is, is, is really important. And then going back to how it affects women and youth, it's no secret that climate change um, is, is not acting equally. I know Hindu, you are a big uh, advocate for equality, but climate change is, are, are hitting people very differently. And women, children, youth are on, in the brunt of the consequence of the consequence of the climate change. Another approach that I like to think about, especially when we have an all women's panel, is to also raise um, the approaches to managing resources. Um, you know, we've all potentially been too trained in a very masculine approach. So, you know, looking at competitive advantage, you know, one takes all. I'm not saying that all men act this way or manage this way. Um, I'm saying it's a particular approach. I think we need to move more to a, 
female or feminine approach, one that seeks cooperation, one that looks at long-term planning and um, the overall um, um, engagement. Um, and I think looking at various approaches to how we manage these existential challenges is, is very critical and very important. That's wonderful. You've actually painted some very stark realities for us here in terms of how climate change is changing, you know, our daily lives and the role of women being so important. Um, and I think I've seen studies that also show that women, maybe because we have more nurturing tendencies, tend to care more for sustainability issues. Um, and I think that this is something that we need to encourage and, so, and also to empower. Um, I, I'm just wondering, have you seen, you know, success stories of, of women, you know, kind of really um, coming you know, to the to forefront of this climate change fight that you could share with us? I mean, I think you've, you've, you've said it uh, time and time again, again, research indicates that when women and when youth are involved in the policy making directed at uh, saving nature and mitigating climate change, um, the change is more impactful and is more likely to be long lasting. Um, so I really believe that there are, like I said, um, um, different approaches to managing the issues of climate change and nature, but I do believe we need to engage more on different approaches that focus uh, a lot more on cooperation, on understanding, on nurturing. Um, it is not uh, competitive and doesn't come from a, uh, a winner-takes-all perspective. Um, so um, that's something that I believe that uh, is, is critical in the way we manage future challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think in our lifetimes, we've actually seen climate change move from a fringe issue into the mainstream. And it was, you know, started being called climate change and then it became the climate crisis. And now we have the climate emergency. And so perhaps I can turn to Ms. Abraham. Um, how is this changing the social life of Indigenous peoples? And on the topic of women as well, how are women specifically affected in that process? Sure. Uh, firstly, just to come to Razan, and I think you are also one of the model of how when we give the uh, leadership to the women on environment, they can do more. So just to let and, and so are you. <laughs> so are you. So are you. Thanks. Yeah. So on indigenous communities, of course, the uh, climate impact is impacting differently the women than men. So one of the examples that I used to give, you know, uh, when you come to the communities, because peoples are depending from the uh, rain season. So when the rain season is there, all the communities are there to do the agriculture, to do everything. But during the dry season, the man responds to this crisis differently than a woman, because they used to say, just honey, stay back home with the children, I'm going to look at the alternative job in another city. So most of the valid man, they go to the next city. And then it is not just when you come to the city, you get immediately the job. You have to stay a month and months and look for this job because it's not like an application or something like that. And then by that time, those who get some money, maybe they will send it back home, but after a month, those who didn't get, they just like jump to the next city and next city. Because, you know, culturally, uh, it is a human dignity. So the man is supposed to feed his family. So if he cannot do that, his dignity is under threat. So then while no one is playing with his dignity, they just like uh, prefer to disappear than being there. And then those who are left behind are the women and children who are back home, who have to look after the older peoples, who have to look for the food, for the safety, for the security, for all in their own communities. And at that time, those women are so innovators because they cannot stay and looking or waiting. So they have to innovate, go to all the places and try to get the food, to get the medicine, to secure their own families. And then during the rain season, they collect the food, they dry it up, they pack it very uh, uh, high, hide this food because they know that when the dry season comes, it's going to be hard and they are the one who are responding. So the woman responds to the climate change in the rural areas 
or into the uh, urban areas are the same because they always like in front and fighting the first to protect this environment. So that's why having the indigenous women's leadership where the peoples are taking the decisions, this is the most important part. We cannot take the decisions and then say, okay, we wanted to have women there. And we cannot also have the women as quota when we are having a meeting or uh, having a project, say at least have 20 or 50% of women. No, use women as a human being because we are part of the human being because we are also contributing with our response. So give the women any space, listen to, from the women and implement what they are saying. And that can help. And one of the examples also I wanted to give, you know, when we talk about the solutions on uh, traditional knowledge, so the man's solutions are based on a bigger repair, but the women's solutions are so in deeper uh, detail. It's very spring knowledge where they can give you the details it's needed from your daily life, not only like for the bigger repair. So when we combine the woman knowledge and the man knowledge together, I think we can sustain our society. And last thing, I also like what Razan said, when we green our desert, we can green our communities. You know, when we talk about climate solutions and when we talk about biodiversity loss, most of the peoples are focusing on the bigger areas, tropical forests. Of course, chat is also part of the tropical forest. We always will protect our tropical forests. But how about the wazis? Because if you destroy the wazis, you are destroying the most ecosystem that are protecting the tropical areas. When you, you destroy the savannas, you're destroying the place that's a door of the tropical forest. So we need to combine all the different ecosystems and who not to do it better? Women. Because when you go in the oasis and you found the women there doing a agroecology in the desert, you really get more impressed. So that's why the indigenous women's roles are so crucial in all the various ecosystems. Thank you for speaking so passionately about that. That was uh, super interesting. And I really like what you said about quotas as well. I mean, women, you know, true gender equality, I think, um, comes with not having quotas, not being forced to involve women to bring them to the table, but to actually involve them right from the start to design our process such that we involve uh, women. Um, I think that's super fascinating. You also mentioned about the detailed knowledge that uh, the communities and the people have. And perhaps I can ask um, this next question to you both. Um, you both very closely interact with indigenous communities um, and you know there is a very strong conversation about their knowledge um, and their local knowledge and how this can be harnessed to, to fight climate change. Um, you know in, in your opinion do you think what lessons can these communities teach us about adapting to this crisis that we're seeing? Hindu, would you like to go first? Oh yeah, if you, if you like, so I will be short on this one. So I think we can learn a lot of lesson. Firstly, we have to check the numbers. So indigenous peoples are 5% of the world's populations, but indigenous peoples protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. So that means we are in the desert, the savannas, the mountain, the glaciers, in the tropical forest, all the world's ecosystem from the oceans, islands, all indigenous peoples are there. When we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity, so that means a lot. And when you go to the indigenous land, it's more fertile than a national park that protect by the government because we know how to keep balance of the nature. So the wisdom of the indigenous peoples. And I'm going back to one of your words also, Razan, from the beginning, the collective rights of indigenous peoples, because we are not on the individual or private rights, we are in the collective rights. And that's also one of the things people can learn because those one help us to live in harmony with the nature. And it must be a lesson learned for the entire world to look at how we are interacting with the nature. We are one with the nature, also, you say that even in the sun, we are not like different in nature, different. We are nature, we are part of the nature. So if we all learn that we cannot protect the nature if we are not realizing we are part of it. So we are still need to learn from indigenous communities. How about you? Thank you. Well, beautifully said. 
Um, I think we're definitely uh, uh, sisters because so many things that you've said, I, I, I very much were, was about to actually say the same thing. So I will repeat because you said a very important number. Five, less than 5% of the world's population protect 80% of global biodiversity. So let's stop at this number because I think it is very telling. So what does it say? You know, you've, you've said a lot, but what should we do? Empower, empower indigenous communities, truly empower. And like you said, not pay lip service, put a quota or, uh, you know, Jessica, you've said this into, you know, make sure that you design the process to engage. But I will even challenge that. You need to put indigenous communities at the forefront of the sustainable development agenda. Um, and what's incredible about that is when you when you're protecting these lands and these areas, you're not only protecting species, you're not only um, helping combat climate change, but you're also protecting culture and, and history and language. The most languages in the world, or you know, the, you know, exist where they exist in the most biodiverse uh, region. And so, you know, for me and something that uh, I believe in and I'm very strongly, uh, you know, it really touches my heart. So I do believe certainly in biodiversity and protection, but I also love to celebrate various cultures and languages. And what I love about the work that we do, Hindu, is that by protecting nature, you're protecting people, but you're also protecting this beauty of language, of arts, of culture. Um, and, and I think that uh, is, is so valuable um, to, to humanity. Um, and, and it's really the world's greatest museum. Um, it's, it's right there in indigenous uh, lands, in indigenous communities. And we certainly need to empower, but empowering is not enough. We need to invest. We need to make sure that indigenous communities and actors working in those regions are provided with the right financing tools to do the work because ultimately everything needs money and you need to be able to provide, uh, provide uh, those, those tools. But one thing that, sorry to, you know, this is something that is very close to my heart. One thing that I find also amazing that we need to be able to try to find a way to work on is how do we connect the various indigenous communities around the world? Because there's so many commonalities. And that gives people, because, you know, in small communities, the sense of confidence, you know, this is not me in my tiny community, in my remote area. Actually, somebody in the Emirates, in the deserts of Arabia, has very similar challenges and, uh, and very similar customs. And, and it's beautiful to see. And one of the projects that I'd like to put forth here um, just as, as a showcase is a project that was done between the people of Abu Dhabi and the people of Chad, um, actually, to protect an extinct species, the scimitar horned oryx. So it's people also coming together to work on uh, a conservation program across boundaries that I also find extremely inspirational. Thank Absolutely. You. I mean, I, 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 really, I really have to react to that. Absolutely right. Culture, identity, this is the richness because it is part of the nature. Because when we lose one of our species, we are losing our language because all those species exist in our language. Maybe not on science or the global languages, but it exists in our languages. So that's really how it's read. And let us continue the project of exchanging between the indigenous communities. I really love that. Let us challenge ourselves and maybe we should do that, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much both for your perspectives. That was super interesting. And I think, you know, it's also an area that's close to our hearts here in Asia. You know, we're surrounded by the forests of Indonesia and Malaysia and the indigenous people there faced a lot of challenges um, to kind of uh, address the commercialization of, you know, many agricultural sectors such as palm oil, which we know, you know, is, is a very interesting uh, conversation globally happening around that. Um, but what I really liked, uh, what you said, Her Excellency, was about how do you connect these people? And also back to Ms. 
Ibrahim, what you said about um, how they export that knowledge, you know, how, you know, they, they know how to keep the balance. Um, so how do they share that knowledge? Um, could I maybe perhaps get very quick views on how do you think this community of Indigenous peoples all over the world can be connected um, and to, to kind of really give visibility to this local knowledge that they have, which at the moment is still very unrepresented? It's, 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 a good, it's a good question. And I think there has been many attempts. So for example, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, but you know, only recently put in a special category of, as a member um, to include indigenous uh, communities and people organization around the world. And I think this is a very good attempt to get indigenous communities, like I said, on the same table. Um, right there from the beginning um, to be able to help design the processes and the mechanisms to, for conservation. Um, you know, it's really interesting when, when it, you know, if, if I was an investor in a business, um, you know, you would look at the business, you would look at the, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, of course, the numbers behind it, um, its uh, potential you know, impact, how it's going to sustain in the future, its profitability and all of that. But interestingly enough, that's not enough. Um, when you look at what makes businesses successful, it's people, it's the people behind the business. And then it's two things that make those people successful. Character, so really your values, your value system, and second, your resilience. And what's incredible about the indigenous communities is they have been so resilient across and against incredible challenges. I mean, you look at the, you know, the, the Bedouin community in Arabia. I mean, how to, to be able to survive in, in a desert environment with an extremely harsh desert environment with temperatures that go up in the summer to more than 50 degrees Celsius, where water temperature, the sea temperature, can go up to more than 37 degrees. Um, you are talking about such an uninhabitable place, uninhabitable place, but it's the values and the resilience of this community um, that has been able to sustain this knowledge um, generation after generation. And now we have the tools to be able to export this, uh, this knowledge. We are able to potentially translate. We're able to um, um, uh, uh, put this information in formats where people all over the world could potentially uh, understand. You are able to also marry the traditional um, knowledge with the scientific knowledge and get them to challenge one another. Um, you know, um, that I find also interesting, but I'd love to hear from Hindu. Thank you. Sure, I mean, I, I pick from your last sentence. So how we can share it is really how we can use the opportunity we have in our hand, the science, technology, and the traditional knowledge together. So I did these examples and then uh, uh, by using the 3D participatory mapping. And now I'm going also to develop another 2D participatory mapping. And I'm calling it participatory because I use the indigenous communities traditional knowledge, those knowledge who are not cheating in the school or universities who are based in the indigenous language of the communities and then with the science-based approach and the technology, I put it together. And it is participatory because it's used a different generations. The old generation who can come and figure out the knowledge in the map, the younger generation who can come and challenge with the old generation, and then the women and the men who can come together. So all those communities, and they know better than nature because they are engineers of all those ecosystems. So when they present it to the local authorities, they present it to the uh, satellite map, it's completely detailed. They know it really more better 
than those who are studied in the school who can write like a book of the PhDs. So this is how we can share it in one way. In other way, at the international level, of course, the IUCN is one, but we do have also now a provision under the Paris Agreement. It is the decision 135 of the local communities and indigenous people's platform. So I'm uh, so happy since the 21st of uh, June, I'm the co-chair of this uh, facilitated working group under the UNFCCC. So we are having this platform to chair with all the member states of the uh, conventions on the climate change. And then we are also having an activity under this platform. So we have uh, the first part 12 activities. It is on how we can share the knowledge, how the capacity building can be to the state and then to the indigenous peoples, because those people not need to understand how they can work with the indigenous peoples because we have our protocol, our culture. When you go to, uh, to the Bedouin peoples to work with them, you need to understand from when you have to start. If you have to talk to the man first, to the woman first, to the community chief, if you have to stay three days before to talk about the project or whatever, it is different. When you go to my community, we have our own culture, our own protocol on how we, you can approach. So we do this study also to help the community understand how to work with the indigenous peoples. And then how we can include those knowledge into the policies. Because at the national level, when they talk about the national determined contribution, national adaptation plan, or a strategy of sustain sustainable development, so all those need to include indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples knowledge. And to include them, they not need to understand from the international provisions to take it down to the policies. So we do have the opportunities, but the issue is, are we enough involving the concerned peoples, the indigenous communities. So those are the challenge and we need all to work on how to involve them and how to make all these provisions a reality of implementations on the ground. Um, Thank you Jessica, can I, can, I, can I jump in? And yeah. I wanted to ask uh, Hindu actually a question. Um, one of the things I worry about is, are we losing indigenous knowledge? Um, um, you know, and that, that, that way of life, because obviously it's been threatened by modernization, it's been threatened by many, many facets. And I can tell you from my own country and my own region, you know, even the language is threatened. Um, there are more than apparently, you know, and that shows you, you know, more than a hundred words that describe the sound of the wind going through the sand. But I bet you, I, I, I only know one, I can tell you that. And so there is this loss now that is, is happening. And that is, uh, that, that I feel is happening in my, my region. And I wonder if you can comment on that. Is this something that you're observing as well? Sure. So uh, the examples that you give is really important on the language. And that's why also UNESCO is doing the decade of the indigenous language. So when we lose our species, and then when like in the uh, UNEP report, we say we lost 60% of our world species. So that means we lost also the amount of the knowledge in the languages. Because when you lose your ecosystem, because you are learning from it, you are losing a knowledge that link it with it. I give you the examples. When I was growing up, so we have a several grass that have a different names. Some of the grass, we use them to make a hat when you are a young, I mean, a kid playing with it. Those grass disappear and they disappear forever. So that means we lose the traditional way of making the hat. And that means we lose also those grass because they are involved to another grass who can make a medicine and a knowledge. So when you lose your ecosystem, I agree we are losing our knowledge. However, our knowledge are also sustaining because when the nature is changing and then while we are observing so many things, when we wanted to see if it's going to be a rain season coming or not, 
you know, maybe in uh, Europe or Western uh, culture, they know that uh, exactly the 21st of June, it is the starting of the summer. And then this is the, it's never changed. So for us, it's changed with the moon, with the sun, and it's changed with all the species we observe. So those is still evaluating. So when we, we know that the rain season is coming, we observe our own petals. So the cattle lie down, their head face the south, and they never put the head in the ground. You can beat them, you can do anything. They never change the positions. So then the Argesta is not fleeing the wind that's coming from the south. So we know the rain season is coming, even there is nothing in the sky. And in addition, we just to look at the direction of the wind. If the wind is coming from south, north, or coming just directly from the south, and if the wind it is heavy or it is dry, so then we combine this knowledge. And then we observe also if the birds, certain kind of the birds, if they are back from the migrations. So when we combine two, three, four knowledge, so we know exactly that the, this rain season is coming, even with the climate change. So the knowledge are evaluating and some of them are losing because of the ecosystems. Thank you both so much for providing so much knowledge on, you know, in the indigenous peoples and the, the, the role that they play really in helping us understand our natural ecosystems. Um, you know, I just want to pick on something that you said, Ms. Abraham, about uh, science and innovation. Um, and there's, you know, Her Excellency, you mentioned the marriage of traditional knowledge with um, science and innovation. Just very quickly, I mean, do you see the role of technology and innovation being used to enhance conservation efforts as well as to help the preservation of indigenous knowledge? So uh, from my side, so I, as I give one of the examples of the 3D participatory mapping, another example that I give it is so uh, how we are putting together the scientist peoples and the communities together in order to preserve the knowledge. So in chat, we start a platform working with a meteorological scientific peoples. You know, they do not use to work with the communities because all the information they give, it is through the TV, radios, and maybe internet, that's it. So then we told them that it is so important if the information are reaching the people who do not have access to the TV radios, but who are using the ecosystem to grow up food. And then that was the first uh, start to put the scientific peoples and the communities together to work. And then we make the facility to translate because the communities do not speak French. And then uh, we, we talked with them and then we make the connection. And then the scientific found that they using a limited number of the science knowledge, but the communities are using a broader holistic way because communities are using the uh, 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 climate informations, the meteorological informations, the biological informations, and then while the meteorological scientific, they are using only one of the science, they do not combine all together. And then they say, when we combine it, maybe it can help us to give more better information because they also recognize some of the meteorological information are ending failure up because they can tell you it's going to rain, but surprise it's sun, or it's sunny surprise it's rain. So then we make the approach of how we can combine the science knowledge and the traditional knowledge together. And we went far to see how the, the communities with the scientific can inform the decision makers because they are the one who are deciding on the work of the science and all. So then we add the uh, negotiators of the climate, the uh, ministries to come together with us and telling them that if you consider the indigenous people's knowledge, you consider the uh, science all together, it can help you to better take a decisions about your future plan. So then that's one of the platform we really established. Then it's really for now working very well. Another example is from the international level. The uh, IPCC, the uh, expert scientific group of the UNFCCC, 
And also the IPBS, the same expert, but on the biodiversity. So both of them in 2019, the uh, uh, climate change, they make a report and recognize that indigenous people's knowledge are so important for the land restorations and it must be recognized. And then CBD, they did together a report just a couple of weeks ago. However, is still some of the scientific peoples. They say they wanted to confirm the indigenous people's knowledge. I'm like, really? How you can confirm our knowledge? Your science knowledge is some of the hundreds of years ago. The traditional knowledge is thousands of years ago. Who are you to come and confirm the knowledge of my grandmother who have it from her grandmother and her grandmother from her own grandmother. Not because we do not write a thousand of pages to call ourselves PhDs, that we are not as fair or we cannot get all our knowledge to get recognized. So this is one of the challenge, just to accept, recognize, and then science and traditional knowledge can work together. Thank you. Thank you for all those really great examples, as well as some of the challenges that you face. Uh, Her Excellency, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really important that um, we broaden our definition of what constitutes science. Um, and, uh, and, and like Hindu says, you know, it's, it's really, you know, why is traditional knowledge not science? You know, um, and and I think it's it's really important that we widen this uh, this this definition. Um, I think the other 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 important thing is 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 not just sort of come to indigenous communities and and uh, depend on indigenous knowledge as as sort of a second and third step you know, but rather have indigenous communities and indigenous people's organizations at the decision-making table, setting the agenda, setting the priorities. Um, the priorities look very different from, you know, 100,000 feet off the ground to what the priorities actually are on the ground. And nobody knows the priorities more than those actually working in, in, the, in those fields, uh, in, in, in those deserts, in those forests, in those uh, lakes, in, on those rivers and in the sea. It's those individuals that have a very astute uh, understanding of what needs to happen first uh, and why. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think that uh, this has been such an amazing and wide ranging conversation, but with an eye on the time, perhaps I can ask this one last question to you both. Um, in one word, how would you describe the future of sustainability? Can you take us? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I think the future of sustainability is when the peoples as human beings live in harmony with the nature. When they understand that we are part of the nature, we are one, we are one with the nature. We must respect the right to land, right to water, right to territories, right to mosquitoes, right to, uh, I mean, lions, right to trees, right to fruits. We must respect what's giving us food, medicine, what's giving us the clean air to breathe. So that means we understand living in harmony with the nature. This is the sustainability for me. Wonderful. Thank you. Her Excellency? I would, I would say balance. Um, you, you know, it's, it's sort of the golden rule. How do we get to this golden mean of balancing um, our, our needs and requirements, but also balancing the needs of nature itself? Nature itself has never been asked what she needs and what she requires. And uh, what we've known is she also requires space, uh, peace, um, um, uh, harmony so that she's able to also live and thrive and it's this harmony and balance between um, you know the inhabitants that live on this incredible planet but the planet itself. I really love that. Thank you. Thank you for leaving that with all of us in our audience, um, this idea of balance, which I think is so important. Um, and so thank you both for being such wonderful speakers and sharing with us your insights and your experience. Thank you to our audience for tuning in. If you'd like to watch the entire session and more episodes in the series, it will be posted on the Zayat Sustainability Prizes YouTube channel. I'm Jessica Chiam. Thank you so much for joining us and see you again.